Good morning, everyone. Our group looked at the research question, how does exercise affect dopamine levels and release? Our topic matters because we can use this information to help people who suffer from decreased levels of dopamine, depression, Parkinson's disease, and even past drug abusers in recovery. The first article our study was based off of was entitled, Stimulant-Induced Dopamine Increases Are Markedly Blunted in Active Co Cocaine Abusers. This study looked at 62 participants, 43 of which were non-detoxified cocaine abusers, and 19 were controls. Using positron emission tomography to measure dopamine increases induced by intravenous methylphenidate, also known as Ritalin. In 24 of the cocaine abusers, they compared dopamine increases when methylphenidate was administered concomitantly with a cocaine Q video versus a neutral video. The findings entailed the following. For the controls, methylphenidate increased dopamine. However, in, a, in the cocaine abusers, methylphenidate's effects did not differ from the placebo's effects and were similar whether cocaine cues were present or not. The second article we based our study off of was entitled Influence of Cocaine Administration Patterns on Dopamine Receptor Regulation. Male rats were injected with cocaine for 14 days to an intermittent one daily injection or a binge pattern, which entailed three daily injections. Through audio radiography, comparisons between dopamine D1 and D2 receptor densities were taken on days 1 and 14. The day 1 intermittent group showed no modification, while the day 14 group did. The day 14 results illustrated that the cocaine administration pattern promoted long-term regulations of the dopamine system. The key point to take away from this study is that the two cocaine administration patterns induced different modifications of the dopamine receptor densities. A brief summary of our study. This experimental study looks at how physical activity affects the release of dopamine within the brain. We are measuring dopamine release in conjunction to increase heart rate. Our manipulated variable will be exercise. We will have the experimental group exercise on a stationary bike for 60 minutes, three days a week, and then have the control group watch an hour of Planet Earth's The Oceans documentary. However, in our study, we also have a subject variable, which is the comparison of dopamine release in participants with a past history of cocaine abuse and participants with no history of cocaine abuse. By testing our subject variable, we will also be able to see to test to see if a past drug abuser's brain can obtain the same levels of dopamine release as someone who has not abused cocaine. Our participants will be as follows. We will look at 100 recovering drug addicts, 50 participating in exercise on the stationary bike level 5, and 50 watching planet Earth, the oceans, in, controlled, in a controlled, comfortable room. Then the other group will be 100 non-drug users, 50 participating in exercise, stationary bike level 5, and 50 watching planet Earth's The Oceans in a controlled, comfortable room. These participants will all be randomly assigned, and they will be of the age group 21 to 40. First, we will conduct a pre-screen survey for, for all the potential participants. One of the questions we'll ask is whether they're currently taking SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or any other recreational drugs, as anyone taking these would affect the results. Another question we will ask is about the history of cocaine usage among the using group. Our participants must have used a minimum of two times a week over a period of three months and must be at least six months sober. The reason for this requirement is because we are studying the long-term effects of cocaine on dopamine release. Therefore, we need to be able to measure and see the damage of long-term use. Both groups will be split through random assignment, the first group of recovering drug addicts and the second group, the non-drug users. So that'll be a total of four groups with 50 people in each one. Similar to Article 1, entitled Stimulant-Induced Dopamine Increases Are Markedly Blunted in Active Cocaine Abusers, all participants will come in to undergo a positron, positron emission tomography scan to measure the amount of dopamine released in the substantia nigra on the first day. The study will be conducted for 90 days, having the participants come in three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, to exercise on site and to take a pre- and post-workout survey about their mood before and after exercising. 
In addition, the control group will come in three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and take a pre- and post-movie survey about their mood before and after watching Planet Earth. Finally, at the end of 90 days, all participants will come in to take a PT scan to measure any differences in the amount of dopamine released in the substantia nigra from the first scan, 90 days previous. Our hypothesis and analysis. Our hypotheses coincide with the findings discovered in Article 1. We predict that dopamine levels will be greater in the exercise group than those in the control group. In addition, we also predict that the group with the highest release of dopamine will be the non-drug using exercise group. Discussion. Our strengths and weaknesses are as follows. For the strengths, we randomly assigned every group. Secondly, this could be a beneficial study for the aid of recovering drug abusers. Then there are the weaknesses, the first of which is not being able to control the outside actions of the participants, such as substance use. Secondly, because of the three-day commitment a week, some individuals may miss a couple of sessions of either exercising or watching the video, which could skew our final results. Finally, some people may not answer truthfully on the pre and post survey questions.